Shortly after 1.30 on the morning of Sunday 27th of August 1933, an intruder forced entry into the downstairs at number 1 Back 8 Moor Street, West Bromwich, in the West Midlands of England. As he removed a pane of glass from one of the windows, it slipped from his fingers and smashed, alerting the occupants upstairs. Gladys Fox heard the noise and woke her husband. Beside the bed in a cot slept their eight-year-old baby boy. 24-year-old Bill Fox went to investigate. He lit a candle and dressed just in his underwear, went downstairs as his wife followed a pace behind. No sooner had he reached the bottom, the candle was extinguished and in the darkness a scuffle took place. Moments later, Bill Fox staggered upstairs and collapsed on the bedroom floor, a wicked boy knife embedded in his back. He had been stabbed several times and died from his wounds in his wife's arms within minutes. The police were soon out the house and, headed by Superintendent Clark, detectives examined the murder scene. They found a set of fresh footprints in the soil outside and spots of blood which didn't match those of the victim and had more than likely come from a cut the killer had sustained while gaining entry through the window. Plaster casts were made of the footprints and it appeared the intruder was either a child or had very small feet, as they seemed to suggest the killer wore size 4 shoes. As officers continued their investigation they learned two other crimes had taken place in the area that night. At Newton's Butchers on nearby Bromford Lane, an intruder, after stealing a few pounds from the till, had helped himself to some food, drank a bottle of milk and then filled a bowl in the sink with soapy water and washed and shaved using Mr Newton's razor. He had then opened a sewing basket found in the shop and repaired a tear in his clothing with a needle and black cotton. In a further incident that night, a thief had also broken into a garage belonging to a Mrs Winifred Randall and had stolen her javelin Jowett motor car. At the butcher's shop, detectives found a similar set of small footprints, but more tellingly was a clear set of fingerprints on the milk bottle and a sheath belonging to a knife. The prints were a match to those of Eric Hobday, a 21-year-old electrician who lived nearby at 69 Sam's Lane. Stanley Eric Hobday was already known to the police as a petty thief, having served a number of sentences in reform school and Borstal for petty larceny and housebreaking. The stolen car was recovered in Cheshire, some 70 miles north of West Bromwich. A labourer working in a field at High Lee, on the main Birmingham to Liverpool road near Lim, was shocked to see a car speeding down a country lane. Reaching a bend in the road, the driver lost control. The car clipped the banking, punctured a tyre and turned on its side. Miraculously, the driver scrambled from the wreckage, and although clearly dazed, seemed otherwise unhurt. Ignoring the labourer shouting to him, he quickly walked away in the direction of Knutsford. Detectives again found Hobday's fingerprints on the steering wheel and starting handle and in the back of the car a suitcase bore the initials S.E.H. The murder of Charles William Bill Fox featured heavily in the national press and detectives chose to make the historic step of asking the BBC to appeal for information on the whereabouts of Hobday over the wireless. It was the first time this had been used for this purpose. Listeners were asked to be on the lookout for the fugitive with small feet and whose height was thought to be just five feet tall. Despite his diminutive size, detectives were soon swamped with numerous false sightings, taking up valuable man hours. While the hunt continued, detectives examined the knife, which carried a distinct coloured handle manufactured by Clark and Sons of Sheffield. It was a limited edition model of a Bowie knife with less than 20 of this design produced and when a description of it was published, a young boy, Gilbert Purcell, came forward with some important evidence. He said a few days earlier he and some friends had been camping in Warstone Field, a few miles from the scene of the murder, next to a man who had used a similar knife. Shown a photograph, he identified the camper as Eric Obday. The manhunt was to last three days. Hobday had travelled north and on Wednesday morning was spotted on the outskirts of Carlisle by a farmer, Walter Berber, who was moving a herd of cows for milking. The stranger looked like he had been sleeping rough and when he saw he was being watched, the man quickly hid his face. Berber, who had been following the newspaper and radio reports of the search for the wanted man, thought he matched Hobday's description and called the police. PC William Elder of Cumberland Constabulary a well-known wrestler based at nearby Mossband had just finished his night shift and was roused from bed. He summoned the help of one of the villagers who owned a car and a couple of hours later they spotted Hobday near Rockcliffe on the road to Gretna Green. 
Hobday was no match for the Burley constable and meekly surrendered. Placed under arrest, he was taken to Carlisle Police Station where he was detained until Superintendent Clark and two detectives arrived at 8pm that night and returned the man back to West Bromwich for questioning. Casts made of Hobday's footprints matched those left at the murder scene and satisfied they had their man, he was charged with murder. Murder, Hobday declared, I have not done any murder. An inquest was held in the following week. Mrs Fox gave evidence of the attack and said her husband had gone to investigate the noise and she heard sounds of a struggle. Come back Bill, she shouted, and moments later her husband staggered up the stairs and died in her arms. She then opened the bedroom window and shouted for help as the killer fled the scene. She then collapsed and had to be carried out of the courtroom as the evidence of her husband's attack continued. Eric Hobday appeared before Mr Justice Talbot at Staffordshire Assizes on the 14th of November. He admitted that although he had broken into the butcher's shop and stolen the car, he was not the man who had broken into the house on Moore Street and stabbed Bill Fox. The prosecution claimed the case against the accused was built on strong circumstantial evidence. Hobday's fingerprints were at the butcher's shop, as were the size 4 footprints, which matched those found at the scene of the murder. A witness had also seen Hobday in possession of a knife, identical to the one used to stab Bill Fox just a few days before, and the sheath matching that knife was found at the butcher's shop where Hobday admitted he had been. Leading for the defence, Sir Reginald Coventry KC made a vain attempt to discredit the footprint evidence by suggesting those found at Fox's house were not an identical match. But this was countered by the prosecution, saying that if the footprints weren't an exact match of Hobday's, they were still those of a man with size 4 shoes, a very small size for an adult male, and Hobday has size 4 feet. The defence counsel asked the jury if they believed a man could commit a murder, then travel a few hundred yards to a shop where, after breaking in, he had washed, shaved, calmly thread a needle to repair a rip in his jacket, and then helped himself to food and drink, before driving off in a stolen car, knowing full well the police would be in the area looking for him. The jury evidently could, and after a three-day trial, Eric Hobday was found guilty of willful murder. There was no recommendation for mercy, and with a black cap draped on his wig, Mr Justice Talbot sentenced him to death in the usual way. Appeal was launched and two separate petitions were gathered asking for a reprieve for Hobday based on his mental health in which it was claimed he was, in words of the time, a moral imbecile, suffering from epilepsy. Neither petition swayed the Home Secretary, Sir John Gilmore, who wrote that he saw no grounds for interference with the sentence. Hangman Tom Pierpoint and his nephew Albert were engaged to carry out the execution at Birmingham's Winston Green Prison scheduled to take place a few days after Christmas. At 8am on Thursday the 28th of December 1933, Eric Obday's size 4 shoes were lined up on the chalk mark across the trapdoors. Hangman Tom Pierpoint pushed a lever and Bill Fox was avenged. My name is Steve Fielding. Thank you for listening to another tale from The Hangman's Record. Please be sure to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Hangman's Record, and my website, stevefielding.com, and also my Facebook page, The Hangman's Record, where you can discuss this and other cases in the series, and order copies of The Hangman's Record books at a special subscriber price. Mm -hmm.